It's time to get inside the Giants huddle, huddle, up, huddle, up, huddle up. on Giants.com. Here we go, here we go. And the Giants mobile app. Get them in there, let's go. Part of the Giants podcast network. Welcome to the newest edition of the Giants huddle podcast. John Schmelk with you. Today's guest, Mike Renner, lead draft analyst for Pro Football Focus. But first, I want to remind everybody that you can find the Giants huddle podcast and all of our podcast podcasts. Offerings on the Giants Podcast Network presented by Investors Bank on the Giants mobile app at Giants.com slash podcast and your favorite podcast platforms. And we're joined by a friend of the program. Every year he joins us at the Combine. No Combine this year, so he'll join us now instead and we'll get him again before we get to the draft. Mike, uh, you're in chilly Cincinnati. I'm in frigid New Jersey. How's the pandemic life treating you, my friend? Oh, it's not great. This is pretty <laughs> brutal this time of year, but... <laughs> Uh, we're going to, we're going to make do, we got the draft to look forward to at least here. No question about it. First of all, tell the folks about your podcast with Austin. Tell the folks about where they find the PFF draft guide, your big boards up there. Give us all the details. Yeah. If you guys are dra- diehard draft fans, we have a year round podcast called two for one drafts. I host with Austin Gale that we do draft and rookies focus, basically player development focus and how guys are doing. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter at PFF underscore Mike put out a draft guide here at PFF where Gives you stats, grades, scouting reports on. We've got 200 prospects in it now. By the time it's the final draft guide, which drops at the end of March, we'll have 300 prospects, team pages for all team needs and you know possible picks for each team, that sort of thing. So you're not going to find the data and stuff that's in that draft guide pretty much anywhere else. Yeah, it's, it's really a great read, guys. Make sure you go check it out. And, of course, you get that with your PFF subscriptions. If you go there and you check it out, you can certainly get that. All right, Mike, we're going to focus here on what the Giants are probably going to think here in round number one. I've had it categorized to me by other people that maybe it's not no man's land, but you're kind of in that area of the draft where you might get be past that top tier of prospects and into right into the start of that second group. Where do you guys at PFF have kind of that – first drop off of talent from that first group of guys in this year's draft. Yeah. I think there's nine guys feel really good about in this year's draft. And that's the top three QBs on our board, Lawrence Wilson fields, Panay Sewell, Jamar Chase, Micah Parsons, Jalen Waddle, Devonte Smith, Cal Pitts. That's kind of the nine that it's like, you get one of those guys, you got yourself a darn good football player. Like that guy can come in right away. And I feel comfortable that they will come in right away and be an impact player. After that, that's when it's kind of, you got guys who are either opt out with a lot of talent that you didn't see much of, or you have some defensive players who are toolsy, but not necessarily finished products to where after those nine, it's kind of, again, it's going to be, the boards are going to differ a lot after those guys. But I think it's kind of universally agreed upon those nine guys. You'd be hard pressed to find them outside of, you know, 12 to 13 on any other, any other draft board around, you know, the league probably. And the Giants will hope one of those nine drop to them, obviously. Let's start with wide receiver or offensive weapon, because we're going to include Kyle Pitts in this conversation, Mike. When you look at that group, how do you guys at PFF rank them? Pitts, Waddle, Smith, Chase, one through four. So you can't go wrong. That's how I want to say I rank them. I don't, <laughs> I don't like to rank them because they're all so darn good in what they bring to the table. Now they are three, or I guess if you throw Cal Pitts in there, four very different types of receivers. And so that's kind of going to be the biggest thing is what kind of receiver do you want? Do you want a physical, true sort of X outside wide receiver who is going to win down the football field, win at the intermediate range, that sort of thing. They just plug in and leave there and let go in your offense. That's Jamar Chase. Do you want a diverse route runner? Probably the best route runner uh in this draft class who can get open from a number of different alignments but may not be you know the most dynamic after the catch may not be your guy who's going to line up on the outside and win one-on-one every time i think that's Devonte smith in this draft class if you want the speed element that downfield explosive element to your passing game that everyone wants the tyree kill effect that's jalen waddle he has that he's in my opinion a much better prospect than wide receiver one off the board last year in henry ruggs or do you want kind of the new age tight end, the Travis Kelsey, the guy that can line up anywhere and win from anywhere, maybe not going to be the biggest, you know, big play threat, but as a guy who gives your offense a ton of flexibility and yes, he's listed as a tight end in this draft and he is a tight end. He can play in line, but I think his versatility is and the flexibility is going to be his calling card at the next level. He just, he can beat any guy that lines up across from him is basically the selling point for Pitts. 
Yeah, and I think the thing about Pitts that impressed me the most, Mike, watching him on tape, was if you line him up on the perimeter against a cornerback, he'll big boy him. You saw back shoulder catches, all sorts of things like that. In the slot, he's running past safeties and linebackers over the middle. So he can win in different ways, and he doesn't move like a 6'6 player. You usually watch a 6'6 player. They don't come in out of their breaks that well. He runs and breaks, and it's at the top of his route. Looks like a guy that's 6'2", which is very rare for a player that size. Yeah, that's the biggest thing with him that I'm the first guy to say, don't draft a tight end in the first round. You're not gonna, going to recoup your value because the biggest thing is usually tight ends, they can't beat one-on-one coverage. They can't go outside and beat a cornerback. They can't, if you get a good cover safety on them, all of a sudden they're eliminated and then that guy is not part of your passing offense. You're kind of screwed at that point. That's why there's only a probably only three actual difference makers at the tight end position in the entire NFL because there's three guys that can actually beat cornerbacks one-on-one and Travis Kelsey, George Kittle, and Darren Waller. Kyle Pitts is one of those guys. I would stake my reputation on him being one of those guys because we've seen it already. He was third in the entire country this year in terms of yards per route run against man coverage behind Devontae Smith and the guy from North Texas in Jalen Darden. So he was third in the country in terms of production when, he, when guys were matched up with him one-on-one, and that's lined up outside, lined up in the slot, lined up in line, wherever he is. He can produce, he can beat the guy across from him. That's the biggest sort of selling point. And that's why if you were just considering him a wide receiver, never going to play him in line, I would still put him in this range in the draft class. And by the way, and with the blocking, you know, he's never going to be a point of attack guy, but he tries. Like there's effort there. Like he, he, like he, if you need him to wall off the weak side of a run play, he can do things like that. He's 20 years old too. That guy is young. He will not be 21 until next October. So that that just doesn't, you don't see tight end prospects that young usually. And so you talk about a 20 year old, I think George Kittle was 230 pounds when he was 20 years old. He was not a inline run blocking tight end either. Guys can grow, you know, guys at that age still get bigger and still get stronger. So I think that's something he can add to his repertoire. And if you're from a giant's point of view where you already have an Evan Ingram and you're saying, Oh, I don't want another Evan Ingram. Evan Ingram was almost 23 years old when he was drafted. He was 234 pounds and six, two. We're talking about a different type of athlete altogether and at a different age than Evan Ingram. There is true development to be had in Cal Pitts' game still. Yeah, and to your point, I made the point on one of our shows last week that Ingram's 6'2", right? Yeah. Pitts comes in and out of his breaks better than Ingram does. Yeah. Maybe Ingram is faster straight ahead, but in terms of side to side, Pitts is already better. Yeah, he's, he's a better route runner coming out of Florida than Ingram was coming out of Ole Miss for sure. Like, I don't even think it's close. Ingram struggled to win not from anywhere really other than the slot at Ole Miss. All right, so let, let, let's go to the wide receivers now. I think we both have Jamar Chase on top here. If you were to pick out something you're worried about with Jamar Chase, what would you pick? Because sometimes I have trouble, Mike, with the – wide receivers that maybe aren't quite so shifty and their separation isn't quite as obvious and they rely more on physicality and things like that. And I think Chase is in that category. So if there's one thing that if there's, you would red flag Chase or maybe just yellow flag Chase, what would it be? I think you kind of touched on it with the shiftiness aspect. He is not a guy who is going to make you miss completely at the line of scrimmage. That is not his game. He's not Devonte Adams in that regard. He's not Devonte Smith in that regard. He is not, uh, that caliber of, I guess I just say shiftiness. He doesn't have necessarily that part of his game, but what he does do is if you don't get him completely cleanly, he's going to get more physical with you than you are with him. And that's kind of how he wins. And so he's a guy that doesn't, that even with, you know, even when he's not open, he's open. It's kind of, he's one of those types of wide receivers. And so if you don't go to a quarterback who's necessarily comfortable throwing to guys who are quote unquote guarded down the football field, he might not get a lot of targets. He might not seem as open, but I think when he played with Joe Burrow, a big strength of that offense was the fact that Joe Burrow was willing to give him chances and Jamar Chase finished all those chances when he was given them. Uh, so I think that's the biggest thing is that guys get their hands on him. Yes. But I think he kind of overcomes that with the fact that he is about as strong a wide receiver as I've seen you know, a true sophomore in college football history. That guy was just a rock beating up bigger corners than him in college football. And I can only imagine after a year of just training what yeah. that guy's going to look like, by the way. Oh, I know. He's a freak. <laughs> Devontae Smith, 175, 6'1". But watching him, I don't see that show up. Do you? 
it does, it's so rare to see it show up. And that's the thing is because he is that level of shifty. He is already so developed and polished as a route runner that, and so physical and he's willing to play strong when the guys are skinny and, un, you know, shying away from contact. That's one thing, but he's willing to initiate, willing to go through defenders to get to the football. That's not an issue for him whatsoever. So yeah, it'll show up more at the NFL level. It just will guys are bigger guys get their hands on you more. They're better and more consistent with their technique, but it's nowhere near such that I'd worry about it. Like we, there is a track record of guys in a similar body type, Marvin Harrison, Isaac Bruce, who have had success at the NFL level, even though it has been a while because I think the only reason it's been a while is because college lifting techniques, they've gotten a lot better in developing these guys physically is I think the only reason you don't see guys like that come out anymore, but I don't think it's that big of a deal and going to really kind of torpedo, torpedo his career at the NFL level. You know, Mike, I think you can make a good argument. Smith, Waddle, depending on your fit and need, which guy is better for your team. When you look at the Giants, who have Darius Slayton, who's a good speed guy, can do a little stuff down the field. Sterling Shepard, who went healthy, can get separation, really good slot player. For what they're looking for, who do you think is the better fit for their roster, Waddle or Smith? I think it's Smith. I don't even think it's really that close because you need a guy who can win consistently – off the line of scrimmage that Daniel Jones can trust to win quickly. And, and I think Waddle can do that. I'm, I'm not going to sell him short in that regard, but his main selling point is what he can do down the football field. I, I just think that in that offense, you have guys Slayton can Slayton can do some of the things that Waddle can do from a deep speed perspective, from a threatening down the football field perspective. They don't have a guy that can do what Devonte Smith can do in terms of getting open on a slant route, getting open on a hitch route. That is his bread and butter. He can do that all day, every day. And I think that that's what that offense needs is that guy to rely on in situations like that. And that's not, again, not saying Waddle's necessarily never going to be that. I just feel very good about that being Smith. Yeah, I, have, I happen to agree with you on that. The other calculation before we move on from, to a different position, Mike, that the Giants and I guess a lot of teams are going to have to make is how big is the drop off from that first trio of wide receivers to that next group that the Giants could pick with their you know, top 45 pick in the second round where maybe you get another premier player at 11, but then you wait for that wide receiver in round two. We know the quality of receivers that have gone the second round the last few years, they've turned out to be really good players. How big is that drop off to you? And what other guys do you think fits that need that the giants have that could be available for them in that second round? I think it's just a big drop off in terms of certainty. Like those three guys at the top, if they are not, consistently 1000 yard wide receivers. They would blow my mind. They, they are that talented and they're all physical freaks in their own sort of way. They, they bring it all to the table sort of thing. So I, I think it's just the certainty of those guys is why you would draft them at the top of this draft. After those three, there's not a guy I feel certain has, you know, has ticks all the boxes sort of thing has so few weaknesses that you can't really see them failing, but there are guys that are incredibly talented that could fill that need in the second round that can be, can do a imitation, at least a close one of what you could get at pick number 11. The guy I would be hoping and praying if you don't go wide receiver in the first round that falls to the second round is Rashad Bateman from Minnesota. Again, I was talking about, they need a guy who can get off the line of scrimmage, win a slant that you can rely on to win in those situations. That's Rashad Bateman. His releases off the line of scrimmage, the Minnesota wide receiver, about as good as it gets in the draft class for a guy who's six foot two, 210, 215 pounds, an actual has some actual size to him very reminiscent of a Devonte Adams in terms of his shiftiness. So not going to be a straight line speed guy, but they have speed at other positions on their roster in the giants. They don't necessarily just need speed. They need again, a guy can get open. I think that's Rashad Bateman because of that lack of speed unlikely to go in the first round. So if he does fall all the way in the second, that could be a home run. Where do you think he's going to run when he eventually does that 40, wherever he does that 40? <laughs> I think we're going to see a lot of not slow forties. Yeah, year. I think so too. Yeah. Controlled <laughs> conditions. Guys are going to be, you know, sliding down hills on sleds and whatnot. But I think four. So because of the favorable conditions, I think he sneaks under four six. But I think realistically, he's more like a low four six guy. I think four high four five to low four six is where he is. But like DeAndre Hopkins was four five seven. Michael Thomas was four six one. I want to say Keenan Allen's four seven. It's not. It's not a death knell when you have size to make it up and suddenness and shiftiness. It's. It's not that big of a deal in the NFL. 
What do you guys think of Terrace Marshall, the big receiver out of LSU, if the Giants do want to try to find another one of those kind of bigger true X guys you could put outside and, and let him win? Yeah, I think he's still underdeveloped in terms of kind of the things I was just talking about, his releases, uh, in terms of his route breaks. But physically, what he brings to the table is, is very impressive. I mean, size, length, speed. He, speed is not a question mark with him. He's probably 6'3", 200 pounds, and going to run the 4'4". I was surprised that, you know, he opts out in the middle of the season. I thought he had a little bit more to prove. And I thought he probably needs to get a little bit bigger before he's really a contributor at the NFL level. 6'3", 200 pounds is still a skinny dude at the receiver position, especially when he said his releases weren't his strong point in college. So I think that's why you're not really seeing him mocked in a lot of first rounds, even though maybe the physical talent is that of a first round type of wide receiver. So you can forgive that though. When a guy's young, still only 20 years old, like he is not a, he's not Devonte Smith at 22 years old. He's not even Jalen Jail, Waddles, 22 years old as well. He's not that uh, at that age and is still productive in that LSU offense. So I do think that because of the deep wide receiver class, he falls. And so he may fall to them in the second round. That would not surprise me whatsoever. Hey, Giant fans, get a New York Giants checking account from Investors Bank with a Giants branded debit card, security features, and discounts at the Giants online shop. You can earn up to 250 bucks when you open an account at InvestorsBank.com slash Giants, member FDIC. The New York Giants and Quest Diagnostics want our fans to come back stronger than ever. Now you can order your own lab test through Quest Direct to get the health answers you need most. All right, Mike, let's take offensive line first before we go over to defense. Besides Penny Sewell, is there anyone else that if he's sitting there for the Giants at 11 that you think might be worth that pick? I could see going Rashawn Slater, the Northwestern tackle slash guard, or maybe starting that guard early in his career. And then if your tackles don't develop, kicking them out to tackle. But I think it's such a deep class that I don't want to say that's a reach at number 11, but that you're going to find talent in the second round. You're going to find talent in the third round because I think I got – there's eight tackles in the top 40 on the PFF draft board. I think all 10 are within the top 55 all the top 10 tackles on the PFF draft board. That's a lot of talent. That doesn't happen wow. every single year. And so usually you see office tackles get pushed up draft boards. I think this year they may get pushed down a touch in terms of there's just a lot of names to go around. People feel comfortable if you're picking at 14. Yeah, you can get a guy in the first round who's good, but maybe you can get a guy in the second round that's good too. And I think that's going to be the case in this draft class. So it, it is a really deep tackle class and interior offensive line class. So if I were the Giants, I'd probably eye in that second, third round of this year. All right, now let's head over the defensive side of the ball. I watched Gregory Rousseau this morning because I wanted to talk to, to you about him and I wanted to really get a feel for, for what he is. And I get through his first 18 plays and I'm like, why is he lined up in nose tackle <laughs> on all his pressures? <laughs> he's running yeah. these wide loops and he's beating these guards that just aren't athletic enough to block him. At the end of the year, you saw more stuff off the edge, but – Mike, when I watched him, I got to be honest, I I'm not sure I saw that kind of burst off the line of scrimmage that, that you want consistently kind of stood up first, then he would go. You like his size, his length, his power. He does those things well. But how do you guys view Rousseau? Despite the fact he had 15 sacks, I see him as a bit of a raw prospect that still has to develop a little bit. Is he or any of these other edge rushers in this group, you think real options for the Giants value-wise at eleven? No, Rousseau would scare me a ton at 11 because of what you mentioned there. The sacks were great. The sacks looked great, but the PFF grade in terms of how was he consistently getting pressure was not. It was those quick wins, like you mentioned, against guards that really just could not deal with the fact that he has these, you know, incredibly long arms and is fairly quick uh, you know, laterally that they just couldn't handle that. But when he had to win against tackles, it was not nearly as good. He didn't produce nearly as much off the edge, kind of similar to like a Jadavian Clowney. And that Jim Clowney never was great one-on-one -on -one against tackles. His best reps always came against guards, against centers and third downs. I think that could be Rousseau's sort of best utilization at the NFL level. But the fact that you're already pigeonholing a guy into that when you want him to just be able to win one-on-one -on -one against tackles, those are the guys that you should be coveting highly. So that's what that's why it would scare me at 11. He's a physical freak, but there is a lot of physical freaks at the edge position in this draft class to where I don't think I'm going to want to reach for one at pick 11. Second round. Do you think there could be an edge player that, that might be more worth the value or are they all going to be the quitty pays and those guys are, are they all going to be gone by the time the giants get up to 43? I don't think they're going to be gone. Cause there's a ton of them. I think on our board right now, we have quitty pay at 11, uh, Jason Owe of, Penn State at 20, Greg Rousseau at 23, the Miami guy 
Aziz Ojolari from Georgia at 25, Jalen Phillips from Miami at 28, Carlos Basham from Wake Forest at 38. Like all those guys would be great in the second round. Are you telling me six guys are going to come off the board? No, they might. I, I don't think it's going to happen because none of those guys have really put it all together to be productive college players, even though they have all the tools. You could even throw Joseph Osai from Texas in there, Ronnie Perkins from Oklahoma as have all the athletic tools worthy of being drafted in the first round, but none of them were productive enough to really warrant it. So I think, yes, usually I'd say draft an edge rusher in the first round. If you really want an edge rusher, talent doesn't last long. I think in this class with how it is, you might see them kind of slip down to the 20 to 40 to 50 range. Micah Parsons, how do you guys view him just in terms of where he fits? Is he an off ball linebacker? Is he a situational pass rusher on third downs too? Where do you see him fitting in, in a scheme, whether it's four, three or three, four or in nickel packages, whatever at the NFL level? Yeah, I think he's a plug and play Mike linebacker, a guy who is comfortable playing between the tackles already, which that was not Isaiah Simmons. You don't have to carve out necessarily a role for him. An ideal role would be a team that blitzes a lot. His probably best attribute is the way he comes downhill and attacks as a pass rusher. He could feasibly make the switch to edge rusher if he wanted to. He has that physical skill set. He is that dominant when he does get asked to rush the passer. And I think he even has said like in interviews that he still considers himself a pass rusher at heart. And so he has that ferociousness to his game. When you see him take on blocks, that part of his game, which is rare to say from a college linebacker, everyone's like, oh, can he take on blocks? Can he translate to the NFL? No, Mike Parsons can already take on blocks that we don't have to worry about, but the coverage, is he going to be a hybrid coverage player? They're going to move to the slot can run deep as a safety. I don't think so, but that's a rare role for a lot of defenses still around the NFL. It's kind of not necessarily as in vogue as it is in college. How about the cornerback position, Mike? I always find that to be a fairly volatile position in the draft. Even last year, Jeffrey Okuda, Great prospect, tremendous player. Struggled in his rookie year. It happens with cornerbacks. When you look at this class at the top, is it Caleb Farley and then everybody else? I think Sertan's kind of close to him. Sertan's not the athlete, though, that usually goes high in the draft. I think he's going to run four fives, high four fives, and there's not a lot of cornerbacks in recent history at the corner that in the first round that ran in the above like a four five five it just doesn't really happen because speed is so valuable at that position you just have to at some point you're going to get you're going to lose a step and you're going to have to make up that step Caleb Farley can make up that step Patrick Sertan I worry about so I do think from that perspective the physical tools no one really holds a candle to what Caleb Farley brings to the table he is a rare athlete he is kind of an ideal specimen at cornerback Sertan's just very technically sound. Like he's been watching NFL football since he was a baby, you know, since he came out the womb, that guy has learned a thing or two from his father and is so good at the line of scrimmage and makes up for it. So I think you're still getting a good player. Maybe you're just not chasing the same sort of quote unquote upside that Farley might have. Is that a scheme fit thing too, where if you're going to play a lot of man and press and stuff, you know, guys that you want to chase all around the field, you want Farley, but Sertan's maybe more of that, keep the guy in front of you, break on the ball, cover three type of guy. Yeah. I think Sertan would be exceptional in the cover three scheme. It, it, somewhere where it can take advantage of just his instincts and feel for the game and not necessarily be putting him on an Island uh, because I think that's where he could struggle. Whereas Farley, I, I wouldn't even pigeonhole him into that. I think he's good enough and, Honestly, he played mostly off zone coverage at Virginia Tech, but I think he's just has the body type to do really and sort of physical skills to do whatever you want. Where do you guys like the depth of this draft class the most? Positionally, like yeah. what, what mm -hmm. position has the most depth? I think the position that has the most depth that you just don't see is offensive tackle. Like, rarely have we ever put this many tackles in the first two rounds. It just it's a position that one usually guys don't come in in the NFL as Giants fans know all too well, come into the NFL and play great right away. It's just a steep learning curve, no matter how good you are in college and how physically dominant you are. And, and two, it's not a position. A lot of you get a lot of talent at any given draft class because there's only so few guys that are six foot five with 33 plus inch arms that have feet that can move and mirror a 245 pound edge rusher. Like that, those guys are just rare. And so the fact that this class has, like I said, probably about 10 guys we consider first or second rounders is pretty special for a position that I think every team in the NFL needs right now. You know, there's not a lot of teams that are set at offensive tackle. 
And so that's the one position I'd say is probably the most special class year on year. Final question, Mike, and this is more of a process question for you guys. I like to look at these timed events as thresholds where you want guys to just meet certain thresholds of positions. All right, I'm fine with this guy. He, he, he met my threshold, but to, to the point you made before, you know, they can have guys running 39 yard dashes. They can have guys running downhill on basically on concrete to get better times. How are you guys at PFF going to absorb the time data, the, you know, even height, weight, length, you know, all that stuff that you guys put into your cauldron to, to come out with your final evaluation this year, given we're not going to have the NFL combine with a uniform environment. I know we're going to have Exos and all that stuff doing their stuff, but how are you going to absorb this stuff and really take it seriously this year, given the unique circumstances? Yeah, I mean, the, the nice thing is we do have historical combine data as well as historical pro day data to give a adjustment. You know, the pro day report times are always better, but you can look at historical times and say they are X percentage better historically to where you get a time from a guy from his personal workout, whatever, you add that adjustment and then that's what you roll with. So I do think there's still ways to dig down to the nitty gritty. If a guy has a gives puts out a filmed 40 yard dash, you could do that off the, you know, off the sort of the timestamps on the film. You can actually do it. You don't have to trust that he said his stopwatch said he ran a 4-2, whatever. So I think that's what we're going to have to do this year. And, and I think there is ways to get real, actually, testing data still done uh, without it being, you know, adjusted or being bad data. Mike, good stuff, my friend. We're going to miss seeing you in Indy this year, God willing, hopefully yeah. next year. Uh, stay safe and warm out there in Cincinnati. We really appreciate the time today. For sure. Thanks, John. That's Mike Grenner, lead draft analyst for Pro Football Focus. We thank him for joining us on today's episode of the Giants Little Podcast. I'm John Schmelk. Don't forget, you can find this podcast and all of our podcasts on the Giants Podcast Network, presented by Investors Bank. For Mike Grenner, I'm John Schmelk. We'll see you next time on the Giants Huddle. Stay safe out there.